Welcome to Liberty.me Studio. Be part of the global liberty community at Liberty.me. Liberty lives here. Hi, this is Jeff Riggenbach. My new book, The Libertarian Tradition, brings together more than 90 of my essays, each focusing on intriguing thinkers, activists, and novelists who contributed in their own ways to the idea that we humans should live peaceful and free with each other. The ebook is available for purchase on Amazon.com or free in our library for members of Liberty.me. Hello everyone, this is Jayant Pandari for Liberty.me and with me is Madhusudan Raj. Madhusudan is a, an assistant professor of economics at Veer Narmad South Gujarat University. Uh, he's based in Surat, which is a city in in Gujarat and Gujarat has been very well known uh, outside India in the recent past because the new Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat before he became the Prime Minister of India uh, and people have very high opinion of uh, people in Gujarat uh, and a lot of people have been very euphoric about Modi and uh, Madhusudan and I probably disagree with some of that but uh, I want to talk with him today about India, Modi, about economics, several things to do with India. Welcome to the talk, uh, Madhusudan. Thank you very much, Jayant, for you know inviting me for your podcast. I'm very happy to be with you, and you know I'm very happy to discuss India with all of your audience. So now, Madhusudan, there is this music coming in the background. Do you run your radio when you talk with people? No, I don't run my radio. This is actually, uh, I live in an apartment and uh, there is one society adjacent to my apartment. And uh, one guy is getting married over there. And this is very typical of Indian culture that when people get married, they play very loud music so this guy has brought some concert style you know woofer speakers and they are right now playing those woofers you know in a big loud noise and people must be dancing I'm sitting right now in my own room so I cannot <laughs> see them but people must be dancing over there so this is very typical Indian marriage a lot of noise right. India is country of a lot of noise uh, that's right. A lot of noise, a lot of smell, uh, and a lot of distractions. And this is, uh, just for the audience, this is past 11 p.m. in India right now. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, Jayant, I was thinking of kind of how to stop this, you know, thing, this uh, noise pollution. And then a thought came in my mind that let me call police. But then I decided not, not to do that because I know police instead of stopping them will harass me only <laughs> so so the best thing is to you know pull out your earplugs and just you know put them in your ear and go to bed you know i thought that you know let me do this podcast with you in night so that i can have some peace because in daytime it will be very difficult because this noise will be everywhere but you right. know unfortunately today i i was not knowing this guy was getting married <laughs> Yeah, but there's noise all the time anyway. So you yeah. uh, and this this in a way Madhusudan gives a flavor of uh, what life in India is like. So uh, I uh, I want to talk about your state of Gujarat. You live in Surat. Uh, Surat is uh, supposed to be a very nice town. I have never been there. Tell me something about Gujarat. People think that Gujarat has become a first world country. No, that is not true. See. Uh... Gujarat, as I told you, you know, uh, in past also that uh, it has been a rich, you know, place uh, since very long, since ancient time. People, on a relative basis. On a relative basis, yes, of course, on a relative basis. So if you compare Gujarat with, you know, other states of India, obviously Gujarat is a much better place to live in. And Surat, for example, is the, my hometown is the second cleanest city in the, in India. And I think fastest growing city in Southeast Asia or South Asia, I guess, uh, with highest population growth rate, which uh, is basically because of the migrant population, which come here for 
job purposes from all over you know India and Gujarat history is also very very long deep as I said around 3,000 4,000 year old history so this state has always been pretty rich you know many of the ports in ancient time here where uh, you have you know flags of 16 17 different countries so 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 a lot of you know maritime trade was going on kind of an entry point you know, point to india in ancient time the ancient uh, civilization harappan civilization one of a few of the cities of that civilization are in gujarat for example lothal which is a city nearby ahmedabad which is basically another big metropolitan city in gujarat and lothal is like 5000 year old city ruin of uh, harappan civilization so at that time also there was a lot of trade going on between you know this place and you know sumer for example in the mesopotamia babylon and other such you know places uh, and surat my city is known for its diamond and textile industry uh, i think uh, around 90% of all the rough diamonds of the world come to surat for polishing we have a lot of diamond mills in the area known as Varacha, for example. They are typical, you know, some group of people from Saurastra, which is a region in North Gujarat, they are very good. They have very good skill of, you know, polishing these diamonds. So we have the diamond industry here and we have a very flourishing textile industry also. We have whole textile market. So they also make gray cloth and sari, which is, you know, a typical Indian cloth in Surat. A uh, relatively rich, you know, city. Uh, people have a very laid-back life, and uh, compared to others, you know, cities like Ahmedabad and Baroda, where you mostly see service-class population. So, as I said, Gujarat is a very entrepreneurial state from the beginning itself, and it has been relatively rich and relatively peaceful, for example. And, and just for the audience, uh, Madhusudan, it's important to uh, uh, convert words into some numbers. The GDP per capita of India is about $1,600 per person per year. Mm -hmm. uh, in in city of Gujarat, it might be twice or thrice as much. But this does not yeah. make uh, Surat Switzerland. Is that correct? No, no, of course, of course. No, it is not Switzerland, no doubt about it. See, I was going to tell you that in Gujarat, you will see very contrast between rural and the urban areas. So whatever little development that you say, like roads and highways, that you only see in the urban areas, in the and the rural areas are completely neglected, obviously, by the governments. The problem here uh, in the last 15 years' time when Narendra Modi was chief minister is that he kind of uh, stole the land of the rural farmers and gave that handed over to for almost for free to his corporatist bodies like Adani's, for example. So you see a lot of, you know, this kind of contrast here. And in urban areas also, for example, in Surat it, it's, itself, the uh, roads are all right, but they, then you see a lot of wastage by the local municipality also. And we don't have a regular, for example, water supply, water will come only for two hours in morning and that's it. You have to, you know, fill your tanks and everything if you want fresh drinking potable water. Uh, electricity is also not very regular. The power fluctuates very much and we have frequent power cuts, especially in summertime. So you see some people are really very, very rich and most of the people who are well connected with the government most of the people still living in poverty. So you come down to the very posh area of Surat City, for example, you see still people sleeping on roadside footpath in night. They don't have shelter, nothing. So poor people are really very poor and rich people are really very rich. And all this wealth is because of this uh, real estate bubble. The land prices have gone up in Surat City because of this bubble, for example. So the farmers have really become, you know, kind of overnight rich, but they have lost their land. They don't realize that, that when the bubble will burst in the end, they will get into a lot of problems. So yes, of course, uh, Gujarat, Surat is not Switzerland. It's still, uh, you know, only pockets of riches you see. Otherwise, most of you just go from, if you, you know, reach, you know, like 150 kilometers from Surat, then you see extreme poverty in the tribal belt, for example. 
Right. So those people who want to understand India should, instead of reading uh, too much of international media, yeah. uh, journalists who basically go and stay in five-star hotels in Baroda and Surat, uh, and they try to judge what's happening in India uh, through, the, through these five-star yeah. trips, yeah. they should actually venture out about 10 or 20, 50 kilometers outside the big cities to really understand what is actually the state of that country. Now, Madhusudan, you mentioned that uh, Modi was uh, well known for confiscating properties of poor people and handing them over to the corporates. Now, mm. you and I are big believers in the free market. Uh, mm. For us, of course, this is not the free market and this is not what, uh, And but a lot of people associate mm. that with the free market. Tell mm. me, um, uh, a question here. Hmm. People think that Modi almost through a magic wand changed the character of Gujarat. Is that correct or is that good lobbying by Gujaratis in North America and good promotion by uh, Modi hmm. and that he was there at the right time? I think it's all mostly publicity as I said and that development that which these people are talking about is only in some pockets that's also in urban areas so there is nothing substantial like for example let's let's let us take example of my own city so right now what the local government which is run by the bjp party the bharatiya janta party what they are doing which is the are, party of which is the party of, of narendra modi yeah exactly so what they're doing right now is you know we have pockets of slum areas and a lot of people live over there so they are just going there and demolishing their homes using bulldozers and they are sifting all these people outside in the outskirt areas of sewer city and then they are building joggers park and some kind of uh, pond over there snow parks for the super wealthy rich people who are the basic voters of this party so demolishing somebody's home and you know kind of you know just uh, because it's their livelihood they're destroying their livelihood they have their employment there they have their roots over there they have their lives over there just removing that and calling that development is i think people don't understand what development actually is you know as, as they say you can't rob you know peter to pay to paul and that's exactly what the narendra modi government was doing and they will do that in India also. I think if you know, they have they are trying to pushing the Land Acquisition Act, but the opposition parties are not allowing that to happen. So, if you will, you know, if Narendra Modi has its way, he will try to do the same thing. He will try to impose this so-called Gujarat development model on India also, which uh, and, which is which is very dangerous. Okay, and this is not a free market model. This is a very fascist way of operating when you expropriate Absolutely. land of poor people to give it away to the corporates. Absolutely. And when you forcefully move poor, pe poor people outside the urban areas, I mean, again, it's important to put this into perspective. Salaries of these people would be anything between 50 to to $100 a month. If you move them yep. outside the city, they can no longer afford to do, do their job because most of their salary will go away in transportation. Absolutely. And these guys, said, work they, about 12, yeah. these guys work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year anyway. Yeah. These are daily wage earners, yes, of course, and all unskilled laborers. And basically, as I said, not only that, they have their family life over there, their, their kids have schools over there. Now, because they are thrown out of the you know, main you know, urban center, it is very difficult for them to educate their child. It is very difficult for them to access the healthcare services. You know, it is very difficult for them to access their customer base, their employment. Most of them are self-employed people doing you know, small trades. So it is very difficult for these people to get back to their whatever standard of living they were having. And nobody bothers, you know, in urban areas, nobody bothers about these people. You know, if you ask even, you know, professors, they will say it's all right for development. You have to sacrifice few things. So there is no sense of justice, you know, amongst the people also. They think that this is very much part of development, which it is, of course, not. Development is not destroying, demolishing somebody's home. 
you can't make somebody better off by making you know others worse off that is obviously not developed that is not even welfare so this is absolutely as you said very rightly these are all fascist policies there is no free market whatsoever if somebody calls it free market then i think they don't understand what free market actually is free market means private property rights and there is no guarantee no security of private property rights in india right now and and i tell you not even poor people even you know even rich people middle class people their property is into danger for example recently the modi government has announced to build a bullet train between ahmedabad and mumbai so i can guarantee that many farmers and many people will lose their land to you know because that land will come in between in the bullet train's track and these the people you know the government will just go and take their land away from them it just snatch it from them and lot of farmers for example are protesting in gujarat and that never comes into news you know the international media will also really focus on that that you know recently we had you know we had the municipality and um, uh, local body election so the congress party came to power in most of the what they call village you know governments gram panchayats so villagers are voting for congress thinking that congress party will change their fate which obviously will not because congress and bjp is not very different but at least people have a lot of discontent with this modi government in you know gujarat so they are raising the voice against those kind right, of policies right but but as yeah. you said by the sudan uh, they are not happy with either of the two parties but that's not enough because if indians don't have the concept of reason and as mm. you earlier said they don't have the concept of justice and fairness mm. if they don't have it yeah. they don't really yeah. have the any moorings to decide what mm. policy is right for the country and what is not yes yes yeah that's very correct and i think that is where education is very important and unfortunately the whole education system is also monopolized by the government so like uh, it's it's completely controlled by the government so all the schools 90% of the schools are run by the municipalities themselves and the you know central government themselves whatever private schools we are having they are heavily regulated by the government the universities are run by the government and if there are private universities they are regulated by the university grant commission which is government's regulatory body so challenges are there yes of course you know and, and as i said earlier also that this will take a lot of time this changes will take a lot of time because right yeah, now i don't see mm-hmm. yeah the funny thing is that uh, when i travel around the world people think uh, india is this nice uh, cozy democracy Uh, with people uh, having a lot of freedoms and uh, pretty much what you're saying is that there yeah. is not much truth in that absolutely and certainly not if you're a poor person which is almost 60 to 80% of india's population yes yes of course and and you have to come to india you know as you said very you know rightly earlier that reading the international media listening these things from others will not really do the justice to the people of this country you have to come to india go visit the rural areas mostly as i said go away from the urban centers and you will find abject poverty you will find distress you will find farmers you know for example last year itself in the state of maharashtra around 4000 farmers committed suicide because they are you know they have taken so much of debt and now they are not in a position to repay their debt so they have defaulted on the debt and banks are harassing them so that's the reason why they are committing suicide in gujarat itself i think around 3 4 you know 100 you know farmers committed suicide last year so that story is not really getting out and even if it is getting out as i said people think that that's okay you know they don't well think indians think it's okay and uh, mm. uh, Uh, international media doesn't really talk much about those things um uh, they uh, i'm just so surprised every i i work in the investment business and i meet all these people who are so euphoric about modi as if modi can change the country somehow 
And mm. in my way, in my view, it's, it might be making India a um, religiously more mm. fanatic and more fascist rather than make it more uh, fair and yeah. a just country. Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. Uh, see, I, I, when Narendra Modi was running for the prime ministership position two years ago, uh, I wrote one of my blog articles, and in that I described him as an extraordinary popular delusion and madness of crowd phenomenon. <laughs> so, so he has very, you know, cleverly, you know, fooled the many people, not only in India, but around the world also. Let me tell you, the, the person has you know, no understanding of economics, and he has no understanding of foreign policy, for example. And I, I don't, I don't know, you know, how Indian people, I feel like the future generation will really laugh on this generation that how, how did you vote for this guy and, you know, kind of made him your prime minister. So it's all publicity and nothing more than that. Just he's very good, not very good rhetorician also, but, you know, he, he, if you have listened to his, you know, election rally speeches and everything, it's very low level kind of, you know, dirty jokes and everything and yeah. mudslinging and people like that. People go to listen to his rallies as some kind of fun picnic or something like that, you know? So that is a problem. And, and I, I feel like, and obviously, as I said, you know, his understanding of economics is zero and thinking that one person can handle the, you know, economy of such a big country is itself a big mistake because as, you know, Ludwig von Mises very rightly said, you know, any kind of central planning, socialist central planning is bound to fail because government cannot calculate, socialism cannot calculate rationally. They don't have price to work with. So the technical, you know, impossibility is there. So in, apart from that, you know, the government, they, they don't have any, you know, ministers also who can understand free market or even liberal policies. So many people say that Narendra Modi, Modi is a right-wing kind of politician. I don't see any right-wing policies there. Nothing like minimum state or nothing like liberal policies also. Forget right. about it's free right. market. It's yeah. It's right wing more in terms of nationalism and religious yeah, fanaticism, yes. I guess. Eh? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. But I wrote, I read many journalists telling that he's a free market prime minister. And, no, <laughs> fascism is not free market. This course, is fascism, yeah. and you have no right to confiscate and expropriate yeah. properties of poor people to give them away. Give those properties away to factories. That's not capitalism, and that's how. Absolutely. People then confuse words and meanings and they mess up the whole thing. More, most, more, everything in, in the realm of ideas. Yeah. Yeah, what they're talking about is basically corporatism, fascism. I will not even use the word crony capitalism because I don't want to use the word capitalism at all because this is right. not capitalism. This is... So... Mm. Yeah, Madhusudan, I we have pretty much come to the end of our conversation uh, and we have to talk more about uh, India in the future to let people know what the reality or at least the other side of uh, of India. But uh, sure. Madhusudan, uh, before we end, uh, I have to recognize that you are one of those rare people and probably the only person I know who actually runs an, a course in Austrian economics in India. Can you tell uh, my audience a bit about it? Yes, uh, from uh, this coming February, uh, I'm launching a three-month certificate course in Austrian economics in the department where I work, uh, the Department of Human Resource Development in uh, Veer Narmad South Gujarat University. Uh, this is a three-month certificate course, and uh, I will be using Robert Murphy's uh, textbook, uh, Lessons for Young Economics as my main textbook. This is an introductory level course. I'm also planning to launch uh, advanced level Austrian you know, economics courses in future if everything goes right. Uh, I also did one Austrian economics seminar last year uh, in collaboration with the Center for Civil Society in New Delhi with mm -hmm. uh, Parsa and uh, 
and other people, Andrew Humphreys and other people came to Kumar Anand and other guys came to my department for that three day seminar. So I'm trying every bit hard to spread the ideas of Austrian economics and libertarianism in this part of the world. Uh, as I told you earlier that uh, young students are the real hope of this country. And, uh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. and I'm so impressed with uh, the huge contribution you are making to the young people in India, making mm -hmm. them aware of the concept of reason and the concept of Austrian economics. Yes, I'm. I'm trying whatever I can do. You know, as I said, uh, I have. You know, as my mentor Walter Block always, you know, tells me that. Uh, Mises and Rothbard passed on the torch of liberty and Austrian economics to him and he is passing on that torch to me and other students of his. So I am passing on the torch to the future generation because every generation needs to learn the ideas of economics and liberty to, you know, keep it intact. The vigilance is very much, you know, important. And a country like India where the idea of individual is very much, you know, kind of uh, not known at all because you are known from your caste and you're known from your family. So in that kind of environment, you know, working for these ideas is very important. And I know about it. So that's why I feel that it is my duty, my responsibility to tell it to other people, spread this message and, you know, hope for, you know, better changes in future. Well, thanks very much, Mother Sudan, for all that you are doing. Um, you are one of the very rare, brave souls in that country. Uh, tell me how people can get to know more about these, this course, your website or something. And is it possible for an international student to come and attend your Austrian economics course? Uh, yeah, uh, for more information, you know, people can visit my department's website. It's hrdvnsu.ac.in, and you can find more information over there. Uh, international students, uh, I don't know, because right now I'm running this course in offline mode, so they will have to come down to uh, India and Surat and my university uh, for three months. And because this is a certificate course, so... Uh, it will only be for two days a week, like every Friday and Saturday evening, uh -huh. I'll, I'll be taking the lecture. So I don't know it will be very feasible for them. But I'm also planning to make this course available online in future. So that once I do that, then maybe more students can, you know, take benefit of that course in India and internationally also. Right now, we have some foreign students in my department, like uh, I have one student from Zambia, I have two students from Botswana, I have a couple of students from Ghana, so they are, they have enrolled themselves into this course, so they will take these ideas back to Botswana and Zambia. One of my students is already back in Ivory Coast, so they are, you know, making efforts to spread these ideas in those respective countries also. So yes, in future, you know, when I will launch this course online, then international students can take, you know, benefit of that. Then maybe they can enroll into that course. Right now, it's only in offline mode. So I think it will be a bit well, difficult. I, yeah. For me, the big charm would always be to physically be present in India to understand the culture. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, it's the same thing as listening to this music in the background and how lack of individuality is such yes. a predominant concept in yes. that culture. But Madhusudan, thank you very much for your time and I want to thank you for everything you do. Uh, uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Jayan, for you know inviting me to talk about what the work I'm doing here in this part of the world on your podcast. Uh, it is very important for me to you know send this message across to everybody spread these ideas as much as possible. So thank you very much for inviting me in your podcast. Thank you. Yes, bye now. This has been a production of Liberty.me. Join us and start your free trial today. The views expressed on this broadcast are not necessarily those of Liberty.me. If you enjoyed this podcast or have any ideas for future episodes, please take a minute to give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. 